Welcome to How Not to DM. I'm your host, Derek. Thanks for joining me on my quest to interview the very best dungeon masters on this plane of existence. Before we get started, I need to shout out my patron, Pun D&D. You helped make the show possible. Thank you. If you'd like to support the show, want a shout out on my next episode, or want an inside scoop on upcoming guests, consider joining. You can find the link in my episode notes, my link tree, or by heading to patreon.com slash hn, the number two, dm. And lastly, as of January 2022, 10% of the money I bring in from ads and supporters like you will be donated to Encircle, a nonprofit organization with the mission to bring the family and community together to enable LGBTQ plus youth to thrive. And now on to this episode's guest announcement. Joel Klein, aka Midlife Dices, one of my favorite account pun names, by the way, is one of the people who seems to have a knack for just about everything he touches. In his past, he's been in bands, he was a school teacher for many years, and lately he's found a niche in TTRPGs. Joel has written a few really useful and interesting supplements to help spice up your game, has gotten into character art and layout work, and has a bunch more ideas he's always working on. Enjoy! My name is Joel. I uh, I go by the name Midlife Dices on Twitter and publishing uh, various things on DM Skills, etc. That name really sums up who I am. I am a midlife playing D and D, etc. Was a bit of perhaps midlife crisis for me. So the name really just naturally came out of that. And how I got into TTRPGs, well, when I was a kid, my brother and then another pair of brothers that we were really close with, one of them, I don't know if they got from the library or something, but we got a hold of AD&D. Maybe even the bread box, actually, to be honest. And, and then we started playing. I had no clue what I was doing. I was like eight. And it didn't make any sense to me. The math of it didn't make any sense. I was the youngest <laughs> out of the four of us. Yeah. And we played it for a good year and a bit, year and a half or so. And it all came crashing down one time that we were playing and my character died. And my brother asked the DM well, is there any way to resurrect him? And the DM said, yeah, there's a, a fount of resurrection, but it's like four or five days away. And my brother said, well, yeah, that's too far. I'm going to chop off his head. <laughs> so he chopped off my character's head. And I screamed in protest. And that's when our parents said, okay, enough. You're not playing this anymore. Oh, man. We had to take a break from, but we transitioned very easily into Marvel superheroes that was put up by TSR. Mm -hmm. And as a comic kid uh, that grew up, you know, started collecting comics when I was eight or nine, that was amazing to make my own superhero and to get to play in that world. That was phenomenal. And that game we stuck around with for a couple of years, at least, and I introduced a lot of my school friends to it. And then I kind of stopped and hadn't touched any kind of TTRPG for decades until about 15 years ago, I was uh, diagnosed with a uh, hereditary neuromuscular disease called Friedrich's ataxia. And uh, and that was fairly devastating to uh, find out, you know, more about that at the age of 32, I was diagnosed. And so part of that, I remember thinking, I need some sort of support group. And they don't even have to know that they're my support group. Mm. I just need people that I can get together with and have fun. And so... 
myself and a few other friends, my brother, the one that chopped off my character's head. I even <laughs> allowed him to be part of it. We got together for a group that started playing board games and poker. And we get together once every six weeks or so and just have a blast playing board games and poker. We did that for a number of years. And then finally, around 2015, 2016, so five years ago, six years ago, one of them said, hey, we should play some D&D. And we're all like, yeah, that'd be kind of fun. So, you know, thank goodness for that friend that brought that up. And we uh, we found ourselves in the world of D&D. And, uh, yeah, it's been great to find that creative outlet at a time where I definitely need it. Yeah. So do you remember the first time you ran a game for people? Was it, I guess it would have been with this group. So yeah. Do you remember that? Do you remember what the game was and kind of how the experience went with your first, first foray behind the screen? It wasn't actually with that group. It was with my kids. And I think my two sons, and a friend and his two daughters. And that was the best way to have my first experience DMing because yeah. they were just kids and totally forgiving. They didn't know the rules that whatever, whatever I said, the rules were, were what they were. <laughs> yep. So no arguing and just crazy creative ideas coming from them that forced me as the DM to definitely be on my toes for it. And it was just a really quick little story that I made up. And I even limited, I even told them at a time, okay, you were all half orcs. Okay. Everyone's a half orc, but you can be whatever class you want because the story was the tribal heirlooms of your tribe have been taken and you uh -huh. need to get them back. So it really was just uh, go over there and hunt those orcs and find your things and come back. It was a one shot. It was a ton of fun. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of fun. All right. So you mentioned the good part about it was kind of getting to make up the rules as they came, but also that, you know, there was kind of a lot of I don't know if chaos is the right word, but but they kept you on your toes. Do you remember some of the worst mistakes you made during those early games? And then also, are there kind of mistakes that you feel like you've made recently that people could learn from while you're running games? Well, so the funniest thing is that my once we started playing, then my two sons really got into it as well. Yeah, and they are way better readers than I am. They are like when they read something, it goes into a vault and they know it. So they read the player's handbook. They read the dungeon master guide. And so when we kept playing, they said, no dad, that's not how this works. It goes like this. So I was constantly <laughs> making mistakes and getting corrected by, by my kids, which I thought, well, that's awesome. You've read it. You know, it. why wouldn't I celebrate that? Right. Of course, yeah. that, that rule totally makes sense. So early on, I faced, a, although they were very forgiving at first, once they got into the game, they they knew the rules far better than I did. And so I learned a lot from just putting something out there and them saying, no, nope, that's not how you do it, which was fine by me. I was an elementary teacher for 20 years. And I always told my students, hey, I'm the happiest person if you can prove me wrong. Uh, if I say something and you say, actually, it's like this, and you can show me like the text or the website or the whatever, great. Like you, you've just learned a whole, a very valuable skill right there in doing that. The world needs more fact checkers. So. I'm yes, quite it does. Okay. I'm quite okay with that uh, behavior. <laughs> yeah. In terms of recent mistakes, my biggest mistake is 
I tried to go with the fluidity of it all. And in doing so, I lose track of some of the finer points, like especially mm. in combat, right? That, you know, that character has that ability active and I f- totally forget about it. And so, thank goodness, I have uh, a couple groups that I DM for, one in particular where we just understand, like, we're all in this together. This is not me playing, you know, against them or anything. They're really funny. They always just dress me as DM when we're playing. DM, this and this, but then they'll say Joel when we're just chatting. But DM, actually, uh, this character is doing this. and Oh, okay, good to remind me kind of thing. So what you can learn from that is be better at taking notes than I am um, because <laughs> I'm just not, this is not my bag. Yeah. I'm laughing only because I, yeah, I feel that very much in my soul that I am also bad at the notes part and the keeping track of all of the different effects and the, the stuff that people are doing. There's some, you know, virtual tabletops that track that stuff for you, or you can buy those little rings that you put around the characters if you've got them on a physical map that can keep track of it too. But yeah, it's it's a lot to handle at one time. I'll show you. The people listening won't be able to see anything, but here's the extent of my notes. Just a whole bunch of numbers. (laughs) Yes. And a few names here and there. Maybe some tally marks. And that, like this booklet is 200 pages of just that. I have graph paper and it's the same thing. It's just like initiative orders and that's about it. So yeah, yeah, I should get better at that. You said you're DMing for a couple groups now. Is it just two? Because I know when we did one of your panels back in the day, you were like DMing four or five groups or something like that. So Yeah, I, I've calmed down a little bit. I had to stop a couple of groups. Uh, yeah. So one group I DM for every week and have been for two years. We rarely miss a week. So that's been, we're just finishing the Curse of Strahd, uh, mm-hmm. which has been a, a blast. Yeah, and I feel like you had either started that or you were kind of in the thick of it when, when we did yeah, that panel we last been year. Thick yeah, because I think we're at, we're just over 100 sessions now yeah. of it. And then another group that I uh, was running Iceman Dale, but I had we've been on hiatus. And then another group that gets together every other week, made up of people that I know from 20-some years ago, we met through a, a gaming forum for a video game that we all used to play. And then we became kind of this community together. And so a few of us, I started getting together every other week to play, and then I actually get to play in one other group. Fun. fun. So, it's always fun to have a regular game where you get to play a little bit, too. Yeah, so I get to play, you know, twice a week, typically, DMing 75% of the time. And that gives you plenty of time to work on your other projects, which we'll get into in a bit, too. Yeah. All right, so... With the groups that you're DMing and uh, that you're playing in, do you have any favorite memories of just really epic or fun moments that happened at the table that you can share with us? Oh, yeah. I'd have to go to the Estrad group. You know, they are, out of the four players, three of them had never played D&D before. One had a little bit. But they are... You know, in terms of role playing and improv, they are so good at all that that it has made DMing so easy and such a joy for them because they're constantly bringing things to the table that I can then massage a little bit into the grander story. Uh-huh. And so We've had so many good moments where they're just like, oh, man, we are so hooped here. What are we going to do? And uh, in the Strahd campaign, you have to gather certain uh, magic items. 
And so they had worked so hard to gather a couple of them. And there was one session where where one of the main NPCs more or less didn't give the ultimatum, but there was there was a conflict. There was something going on between one of the players that the other players didn't know about. He and I had had some in, uh, one-on-one sessions uh-huh. playing through parts of his character's story. And so it came to a point where he willingly gave up one of the magic items to an NPC, and the rest of the group was like, what are you doing? <laughs> we worked so hard for that. But it was all about fulfillment of that character story that he and I had been working through. And, I mean, so all these guys, these guys have known each other for 30, 40 years. And so it's a really safe group to be part of. Uh, I've known them for 25. Three of us used to be in a band together 25 okay, years Okay, yeah. Ago. So we know each other quite well in that way. And so they just have so many moments that you can tell there's that unquestionable, like, we're here for each other sort of thing. And it's you don't have to worry about that at all. But what are you doing? You can't be doing this kind of thing. And so there was even a little bit of some fighting going on, you know, yeah. with and normally I wouldn't recommend fighting between players with dice, but with these guys, like they were all for it. They thought it was a blast and, you know, they had a lot of fun kind of taking each other down in that way. And it became such a big part of the story. Yeah. That group is a real hoot to DM for. It sounds like it. So, when you started running games for your kids and your friend and their kids, were there any particular sources you looked to or people you kind of looked up to as influences on how you run games, you know, or, you know, is there something from YouTube or is there a podcast in particular you enjoyed or are there books or resources that you really kind of dug into to get some ideas? Well, I definitely stick to the, you know, official 5e stuff. My brain, I don't know if I can handle going beyond that realm too much. And so, you know, just reading campaign books, starting with something simple like uh, Lost Minds or uh, Dragon of Ice Pirate Peak, etc., yeah. And then in terms of like how to DM uh, people in my group, there was a the friend of mine that said, hey, let's try D&D. And he was DMing us through a group. He was a big part of that. And then another friend of mine who anytime I watch a clip of Conan O'Brien, uh, it's like these two people are brothers, Conan O'Brien and my friend Tom. He just behaves a lot the same way. And I often think, I don't think Conan O'Brien, he's been fairly anti-nerd, anti-fantasy, DD, always mocking it. But he would be a hoot to play DD with. And that's like playing with my friend Tom. He is just, yeah, he will come up with crazy things to say, ways to do things, whereas everyone else is hesitating about, how should we do this? He'll just, uh, I'm going to walk up here and I'm going to be, you know, oh, here you go, take this gold and blah, blah, that kind of thing. We're all like, no, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think a lot of it came from probably the two of them, my friends, Rob and Tom. And, and Rob, especially the structure of how to DM, and then Tom, kind of the wild, fun side of things, like the improv side of things, just kind of going with the flow is a huge part of it. And then, you know, on YouTube, there was, I would watch a lot of um, Realmsmith. They're a Canadian group from Toronto, I think. And they 
run some really fun campaigns. And yeah, I kind of whatever I can get my hands on. I'm not much of a critical role watcher, although they look like they're having fun. Yeah. Yeah. It is kind of a, a a matter of preference. So I know there's lots of people who love Critical Role and lots of people who just, yeah, just it's too much or they just aren't really interested and that's just fine. Yeah. I think a big part of it too is I taught elementary kids for 20 years and a huge part of teaching is how am I going to sell this to them? You know, a phrase that I learned early on in my teaching is that instead of saying we have to do this, I would say we get to do this. So instead of we have to do this page of math, we get to do this page of math. Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't take much critical thinking just to see right past that. But initially, it's this wave of positivity. I get to do this. And so a big part of it was just working with kids for 20 years and how do I keep them entertained? How do I keep kids want to come back? Because the hardest thing for me, I remember being so heartbroken when my first year teaching grade three and I hit on the first day of school to say, you know, Mr. Klein, I don't really like school. I don't want to be here. And immediately my thought was, well, I didn't say this to him, but I'm like, I'm going to make you want to be here. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make you want to be at school and to want to learn and to grow. That's going to be my goal. And and so, so much of the skills of entertaining 10-year-olds ends up coming through in my DMing. Not to make it that my players are of the same intellect as a 10-year-old. Although sometimes, you know, a door is just a door and they spend half an hour debating how to open said door. But I think the skill of how do I make this fun for you? And how do I make you want to come back? Because Mm -hmm. that, you know, that's the best phrase you could ever hear as a DM is, when are we playing next? Yeah, that's that's what you're after. It really is. Yeah, and I'm sure teaching has, and, and maybe even in subconscious ways, has affected the way you run games. So it does sound like it was a valuable place to pull from. This episode of How Not to DM is brought to you by Robot Republic Network. The Obanus Isles sit just off the mainland at the center of the dimensional clock, a place where fey and monsters live alongside humans. Our town council are charged with keeping the peace between goblins, saving townsfolk from having their souls trapped down wells, and finding the Kraken love, all while sorting out the village fate. Join us on our journey into the mysterious and the mundane at youtube.com slash robot republic or by searching robot republic network wherever you get your podcasts. Also, coming March 27th, make sure to tune into Tavernot's charity stream in support of the Transgender Education Network of Texas, or TENT, featuring cool community members, games like Caltrop Core, Blades in the Dark, Fiasco, and Epic Level D&D, and awesome prizes for the audience. For more info, check out Tavernot's link tree in the episode notes. Tavernot is one of my patrons, so it would mean a lot to me if you could help support him in this very good cause. And now, let's return to the show, starting up with a brand new minigame for Season 2. This week on Quickfire Chaos, Joel and I are going to use some random dice rolls to create a roleplay scenario so you can hear him at work. Okay, do you have your D100s ready? Uh, yes. Okay, first one is personality traits, so let's see what we got here. 87. 
proud, filled with or showing excessive self-esteem, and will often shirk help from others for the sake of pride. Oh, nice. Okay, next is voice description. Okay. Eleven. Eleven. Their S sound is too long, like a snake. Nice. Lastly, what you are asking us to go fetch for you. A 19. You need us to deliver some goods for a local bakery or similar establishment. All right. All right. What do you want the business to be in? What do you want to be called? And then that's how I'll address you when I show up. Oh, um, better, better bread than dead. (laughs) Okay. Better bread than dead. I like it. All right. So I will be playing a dreamy sounding wizard who's showing up and she's going to ask you what, what you want us to help you with. So someone has told us for some reason as like this party to show up. So I'll show up and I'll say, we've heard you need help. And then we'll just get into it. Uh, hello. Uh, are you the owner of this establishment? Well, can't you tell by my finery? And, you know, I'm not wearing just a simple apron. This fabric is very expensive. Uh, yes, uh, apologies. Uh, it it does seem very expensive. Uh, we were told that the owner of this bakery had an important job for us. Hmm. Hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. It is important. I have these croissants and other delectables that need to be delivered, but I am. As you can see, far too important for such a task. I'm willing to pay. Do you accept fritters as payment? Are there apple fritters? Um, apples, yes, apples. Yes, I can. I can have one of the two, one or two of them. Uh, Put apples in, yes. Very well. I I think we could do this. I do have to ask, though, is there not someone you hire for these sorts of deliveries that could help you? I I don't mean to make it sound trivial, but of of course your business is very important. I can give apple fritters to someone else. Uh, You happen to be here and you happen to say... would like to help uh, but mm, yes I, I do typically but they are not here and maybe you maybe you had something to do with that but, mm, yes. oh, I, I cannot speak to the location of your previous delivery person but we, we can do this for you we will be back as soon as possible huh Yes, uh, I do take a break when the uh, when the sun hits the uh, the lamp post uh, there, and so be sure to uh, arrive before then. And I do uh, have a, a short uh, siesta at that time. I see. Well, we will be here in time to not wake you. Yes, I require the sleep to keep my skin youthful and and everything clean and just right. Yes, well, we will uh, be on our way then. Yes, thank so, you. Thank you very much. Next time you need uh, anything, come back to Better Bread Than Dead and I will be sure to have what you need. Very kind of you. All right. That's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it's been fun just to kind of mess around a little bit and play a little bit of, or do a little bit of role play, you know? All right. So let's get into now questions about your personal projects, stuff that you've been working on. To start off with, 
How did you get into homebrew and design and art and that kind of thing that you've kind of made your TTRPG projects? You know, the the first thing that I worked on was when I put out in June of 2020 what's called the Rock Contours Lexicon. And I put them out as individual volumes at first. And it really came about because I was DMing a lot. I was playing four or five games a week back then. And I would get so tired. And I realized that my word choice was becoming really redundant, especially in the you know last hour of every session. And so I wanted a way, uh, something that would help me fight that. So I worked on Raconteur's Lexicon, which was basically just lists of words uh, having to do with, like, what's a different way to say bludgeon? And what's a different way to say throw or dodge? Or what are different ways to dodge? Like, you know, you miss because of a dodge or because you just miss. And coming up with a whole bunch of words. And so that really got me started in creating things for D&D. And came up, the first volume was about combat. Second one was about spells. Third one was about environments. And the fourth was NPCs. And it just kind of kept on going. And that kind of introduced me to the whole possibility of I can make things and people actually like them. People buy them, which is cool. And I get to keep making stuff. So then I started just branching off into all these different things that I could start making for. And a lot of it was like finding little gaps. So for instance, uh, I made a, a list of valuable spell components. Because I, as a DM, hated looking through, you know, three or four books to find out, well, can you cast this spell? Like, do you have the right components for it? And so I came up, made a a document that I have on DM's Guild called Valuable Spell Components or Materials. What a good pitch. I don't even know the name of the product. (laughs) And... Once again, like just finding a bit of a niche gap and saying this doesn't exist and I would really find this handy and other people buy it, so they must too. Then I started getting into, then in the last year, I started actually getting into like creating magic items and things like that. Uh And in January, I put out a release called Professor Bucknold's Closet of Confiscated Spellcasting Foci, and where I basically just, once again, thought of a a bit of a gap where I felt like, you know, nobody ever talks about spellcasting focuses. And whenever I'd ask my players, what's your focus? They're like, I don't know, wand or something? These are people that are really good at coming up with stuff, but that was something that would often be neglected. So Uh I thought, I'm going to make something that gets you to think of your spellcast focus and make it something a bit more flavorful. And yeah, so along with that, like now I've just started creating, uh, for the first time I've started creating monster stat blocks. I have a thing called Monsters Misspelled. When I'm typing on a monster and I do a typo and it makes something else, I'm like, hey, that could be a monster. So the first one was that I was typing twig blight and I forgot the T as a wig blight. I'm like, oh, <laughs> wig blight. There we go. That's kind of cool. A little like hairpiece that jumps around from person to person and drains their intelligence. And my second one, I just put out in the January. It's a knoll, but it's K-N-O-L-L. So it's a hill that basically will attack adventurers. Uh, The idea being that they settle in for a camp and then all of a sudden the hill comes alive and begins to attack them. Yeah, so it really is just... I'm at a 
a stage of I don't really have one thing that I do. I kind of just do whatever comes to my head. Yeah. Honestly, though, that's sometimes where the best ideas come from instead of trying to be confined to one particular space, right? So you've published, what, five or six different volumes of the Raconteur's Lexicon, and and that's really cool. I, I had a guest on a few months ago who made a specific chart for, like, types of damage for combat, right? Like trying mm. to think of ways to describe it, but you've gone and, and done, you know, tons of different parts of, of the games and all of these are, you know, a dollar 50 or less. There's one called the expanded edition and that mm-hmm. collects all the volumes. Plus it has its own monster section. I think it has over 3000 words in it. It, one really fun part of it is the spell verbal component generator. So I list, I think, about 125 words in seven different fantasy languages. And so if you're doing like a spell like Chill Touch, you look up the word cold and hand or touch, and then just go across to whatever language you want to put in. You want to put in Dwarven. There are the words, and now here's your verbal component. Because, once again, it totally came out of me realizing when, you know, I'm trying to make something dramatic, you know, and then the evil necromancer held out his hands and said, Boogala Oogala! <laughs> like, yes. oh, so bad. So I Abracadabra. needed something. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I needed something to make those sound more authentic and... Um, dramatic and so i made that spell component the verbal generator and i love it i love using that that's such a good idea and you know you could use it in your home game like you're saying or if you're you're doing a stream or a podcast or something it would make it feel more real instead of you know it's kind of just above the table talk oh i cast fireball you know you you're like making it seem like it's happening in the moment i like that yeah exactly and that's, I think, the whole part of, you know, with tours is, once again, it comes from that need to, I want people to have fun doing this. And so, you know, you hit, you miss, you hit, you miss. How many times do we hear that in a session? But now if I can make it something visual, that, you know, players are going to be like, whoa, you know, okay, so you rolled an 18, but if I can describe it as, you know, you hoist your axe over your shoulder and you come down with a a strike and you cleave your opponent, that's far more entertaining than you hit. Yeah, like you said, the imagery, yeah. The biggest benefit of it is the more I do it, the more they do it. And mm. they will start to, you know, like Matt Mercer is the whole, uh, and how do you do this? That For me, that's not just when you kill the enemy. It's like throughout the battle, right? They're, they're saying, well, I, you know, I slide up to the enemy. And just at that moment, I, uh, you know, unsheath my rapier. And I lunge it into their, you know, chest cavity kind of thing as they roll. And if they miss... Then I get to come up with, well, no, you don't quite lunge it into the chest cavity. Here's what happens. And so there's a a fun interplay between the DM and the players when it comes to that kind of thing that it's not just me being the narrator. We are narrating this together. We are making this visual and immersive for each other. Yeah, much more immersive that way. So you mentioned you kind of started in the summer of 2020. What were some of the hurdles that you had to jump over to get into this kind of work? You know, like learning how to design the stuff yourself, finding artists or, or, you know, making the art yourself. What, what are some of the the steps you had to take to really get into the quality of content that you've been creating? Yeah. I mean, at first it was, with rock on tours, it was it was uh, a lot of finding really weird words for things and deciding, yeah, I don't need that word. When it comes to putting things out on DMs Guild, 
they make that pretty easy for you. They there's artwork that can be used as long as you're publishing something there. So, you know, I need to find a, a decent word word program because I don't have Microsoft Word, and it was all about functionality then. In the last year or so, that's when I got into the drawing and illustrating side of things. When I was a kid, the first my first love was drawing. When I was, you know, three or four, I started drawing. And until I started playing guitar, you know, late junior high, my world was comics and drawing. And so, uh, but it, yeah, a year and a bit ago, I got an Apple Pencil and I started using Procreate. And I started just drawing stuff and it was really bad at first. And then it slowly got better and better. And, you know, I was pretty happy with when I put out Bucknell's Closet of Confiscated Podcasts and Folk Guy that I was able to say, like, everything in here start to finish was something I did. I illustrated it. I wrote it. I designed it. I did the layout of it. Everything in there was something I didn't have to borrow. I didn't have to you know, et cetera. And so that was a pretty cool point to come to. Now that I've done that, I know that I can do it again. And so now it's a matter of how do I just keep doing it and do it better, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Just continual improvement kind of thing. Yeah. That makes sense. One of my patrons, one of my brand new patrons, as of recording this episode, pun asks, if you could go back in time and give yourself some advice before you got into game design, what would it be? Give myself advice. Uh, just go with your gut. Don't overthink, uh, especially early on in the process. Just let yourself go. As somebody I often tell my students, and they hated this phrase, <laughs> but I would say, you know, at the beginning, when we're working on a, you know, a creative writing project, first thing you want to do, I said, is to puke out your ideas. <laughs> you just blah, and get it all out on the page. Right. So and eventually you're going to your filter is going to kick in and say, yeah, that idea works and that doesn't. And that's good. I got to get rid of that. Or I can change that. You know, if I change that, then it actually ties in with this really nice. Problem being that we often put a filter on too early in the process. Mm -hmm. So you need to kind of let your brain just kind of go and get it all out there. And, and then learn when to put the filter on. I think that's, something I still work on. For me, actually, that skill really started to happen when I was writing songs. I was mm. a songwriter for many years and put out a couple albums in various bands and stuff. And so the idea of, like, you get hit with this moment of inspiration, chords or melody or something, and I would just try and ride that as much as I could. Because I knew that at one point my brain would say, oh, oh, this doesn't make any sense. And I wanted to just keep on pushing myself as long as possible to get to that point. And maybe have, you know, two verses and then a chorus by that point. Because when you filter too soon, you're like, okay, what does that line mean? Now, now the inspiration is lost. And you're stuck. So I think with with design stuff for D D too, a lot of it is I have an idea, okay, I'm just gonna see what I can get out of this. And then eventually I'll go back through and see how I can uh, make it better, etc. That's good advice. I like that. You've also done some other stuff like I've, I've mentioned before, facilitating DM advice panels, you know, you're drawing. Uh, so how do you keep up with all of the different kinds of content or do they all kind of mesh together like you were describing when you created the whole Professor Bucknell's uh, confiscated spellcasting foci from top to bottom? 
Yeah, I mean, it's been a progression, right? You know, when I was hosting It's About Jam Time last year, that was really such a valuable experience in terms of I just want to get to know people. And I want people to get to know people. One of the most satisfying byproducts of that show is having people introduce themselves to each other and then seeing on Twitter that, you know, they continue to have a relationship, etc. And that's really what that show was about was I just want to get to know people and yeah. we get to talk about something that we all like to talk about. And then from there, it really was, I have a constant need to be making something, to be creating something. And so when I took a break from It's About DM Time, yeah, my brain needed to fill that gap. And so I just started creating things and started really getting into drawing things, you know, with midlife minis, the uh -huh. little, uh, and, you know, cartoon faces. That was just a fun distraction for like a month and a half. And they were fun to do and trying to do something that I hadn't tried before. I think that's a big part of, you know, thank goodness for a hobby like this, that we get to explore all these different ways to uh, create. And that is such a fun sandbox to play in. And to get to be in that sandbox with other people is even better. Yeah, definitely. And it was fun to be part of that first little panel you did. And it's been fun to kind of watch it grow from that too. So, yeah. And yeah, you know, I hope to bring it back at one point. I'm, I know that at one point I'll get antsy enough to do it again. Yeah. It was a ton <laughs> of work coordinating, you know, getting five people on board every week and getting, you know, a new topic and new questions and all yep. that kind of stuff. It was a lot of work and it was, I was driven to do it and I'm thankful that I got to do it. But so when I bring it back, it's going to be possibly a little different, but at the same time, there's so many other people doing that kind of thing. I'm not saying that they're doing it now that I'm not, it's right. I think many of them were do many people were doing it long before I just didn't know about them, uh -huh. and so I kind of feel like, kind of like going back earlier, the when I make something, I like to fill a gap. And at that time, it's about the end time seemed to be filling a gap, but I don't think there's a gap. I think that there are lots of other good shows out there that do this kind of thing. So, you know, yeah. I'm not sure if it will come back. All right. Well, if it does, let me know. And speaking of the naming and, and of puns, it's about DM time is, is a top tier <laughs> pun, just like midlife dices. So, oh, yeah, that, man. Was, that was a, a good run to you. I, I love those. You know, midlife dices came because the group that I played with Strahd with were all you know, upper 40s or, or 50 year olds. So I'm like, okay, we're all, you know, middle aged, midlife, midlife crisis, midlife dices. And and I remember I was at the supper table when, it, when I got hit with that one. I was like, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Inspiration strikes at all sorts of weird times. Yeah. All right. So, Joel, what are your words of encouragement and advice to, first of all, let's start with aspiring slash new game designers and, and uh, supplement makers, content creators, that kind of thing? Uh, just make something. Make, make stuff for, uh, for yourself. Don't worry about how you think it's going to be received. Don't worry about, you know, how many downloads is going to get, how much money am I going to get. Make it for yourself 
and and it's something that you will use and enjoy, etc. And eventually, at one point, other people are going to find it too. Yeah, that's all I got for that. All right. Then how about to people running games? What's some of your advice for those people? You know, one episode of It's About DM Time that we talked about, we were talking about being professional DMs. Uh And the phrase that kept on coming up in that episode was just be the friend that says you should do this. You should try this. And so I would try and be that friend for anybody. Just try it. You know, you're going to make mistakes. There are people that have been doing it professionally for years, and they make mistakes too. Nobody can think that they're going to memorize entire books and and rules, etc. Especially when so much of the game is about going with the flow. Don't worry about all that little stuff. You're there to have fun. Your players are there to have fun. Uh, rules, I think, are important in terms of consistency and balance. Right? Because otherwise your players feel like, hey, this happened last time, but now it's not happening this time. What's going on? You don't want that kind of thing. You want players to feel like they their um, actions have consequence. And if the rules are arbitrary, then that's not going to happen. But that said, just have fun. Give it a whirl. And allow yourself to get into it. Start with something small. Start with something easy. A one-shot or like, you know, when I say one-shot, they often happen over three sessions kind of thing. Nice and small and contained is a really good way to start. Great advice. All right. Where can people find the stuff that you've made and where can they find you? And then finally, are there any new projects you've got on your plate or stuff to look forward to that's coming out soon? So you can find me on Twitter at Midlife Dices. And eventually I'll get my Facebook page going because I've got the name. I just haven't done anything with it. I'm on Instagram as well. Wow, where else am I? My leg tree is really huge. Uh, YouTube and <laughs> Twitch. I think on Twitch it's midlife underscore dices. And I am always trying to make up something. Right now my challenge is every week I'm going to have something that I put out. Whether it's a monster, an item etc. I want to get more into map stuff. But uh, a fairly new project that I've got is some stock art decorations. Oh yeah. That people can purchase called uh, Folio Finery. And right now as of this taping I know that I have the Dwarven Gold set and I will keep expanding with that idea. Basically I just want to make things that people can use to make their documents look nicer instead of just a plain white page or or try and break from the uh, always having to make it look like a, you know, a D&D official product that you, I mean, great programs on like GM Bindery and Home Brewery and stuff. But, you know, this basically just Gives people sets of, here are things you can put in the corner. Here's something you can put, you know, to decorate the header of the footer or different things for the pages. And so, yeah, the first set, Dwarven Gold, kind of all has a a bit of a brushed gold look to it. There will be a stone set, and there will be elvish, and, you know, magic, and all that kind of stuff. I, whenever I make something, I can never do it as just one thing. <laughs> I'm noticing I that. I feel like I need to make a whole bunch of possibilities. Yeah. Well, nothing wrong with, you know, taking on big projects you know you can finish. So 
But yeah, I'll make sure to put links in the episode notes here for all of Jill's stuff on DMs Guild and his link tree and everything. So you can find all those links. You can find him. You can find all of the old episodes of It's About DM Time and stuff for more advice if you're looking for it. So yeah, thanks so much for joining us, Joel. It's been a ton of fun. You're one of the first people I kind of really connected with in the TTRPG space when I when I started my show. So it's been fun growing together and, and also doing stuff together like this. Yeah, no, I want to thank you. You were someone that I often reach out to. You know, how do I, I think when I was starting up, trying to convert It's About Damn Time to a podcast. I'm, Derek, how do I do this? (laughs) So (laughs) thank you. Uh, It's been certainly fun to uh, watch you and your show grow, too. That's been pretty exciting. Definitely. Well, I'm really excited to check out all the the new stuff you're coming up with this year. And uh, yeah, we will definitely have to do some more stuff together like this. Sounds good. Thank you for listening to How Not to DM. Now it's time for a sneak peek into next week's guest, DM Sam of Roleplaying and Roleplaying. How many games are you currently running? Or I guess what's the most amount you've ever run at one time? Oh, uh, beginning of the pandemic, I was running seven and I was in 12. Um, (laughs) Yes. (laughs) 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 Okay. I'd have some double headers because I had nothing else to do. Uh, And I was taking a gap year between high school and college. So I just had work during the day and I had nothing else to do. So I'm like, uh, people are like, hey, you want to join my game? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I've got nothing else going on. <laughs> to hear more about Sam's work on the podcast, his advice for marketing your work, and his best advice for running games, be sure to tune in next week. Remember to check out my Patreon if you haven't already for even more sneak peeks. Next time you get the chance, share this episode with your friends and family around your game table. Another great way to help me boost the show is by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or rating the show on Spotify. I appreciate all of you for helping the show grow. Thank you to the team at T4C Studios for helping edit and produce this episode. My intro and outro music is by Daniel Zombo. The Quickfire Chaos music is by Exacat, and the Quickfire Chaos mood music is by Arcane Anthems. Check out the episode notes for more of their great work. And, as always, until next time, roll some Nat 20s for me.